The submitted name of the talk, Evolving Concepts, What the Bleep is Type Anyway. It got censored, as you'll notice, for the uh, brochure. Um, of course, what I was really meaning is what the devil is type anyway, so there's no need to worry about it. I'm thoroughly English. Um, but I thought it's, it's a very important question, I think, really centrally important to our type community. And strong subject matter deserves deserve strong language, I believe. That's why I thought I would do this, even though I censored it. Um, so I am Richard Owen. My type preferences are confirmed I, N, T, and J. And I'm the current BAPC treasurer, so I'm the one that was processing all your payments for the conference. Thank you for paying on time. Well done. <laughs> and uh, I joined the board a year ago. I'll be at the AGM tomorrow giving a talk. I do talks in London. I'm now based in London, though I'm originally from Newcastle, which you can see here, the beautiful River Tyne. And I've moved my workshops down to the southeast, uh, where I'm now based in the south of London. I do talks, so I've got a website, free talks, actually links to a meetup group. I run a couple of different meetup groups, and I use those to do introductory talks about time for the general public. People who are just interested in it might want to know what it is and how it can help them in their lives in some way. And then maybe they go on, as some do, to book my workshops, which are the Who Are My Really workshops. That's whoamireally.com, my other website. And those websites, they consist of like seven half days. Um, Andy here at the front, he's actually been on all of them. So ask him if you want to know more in an unbiased way. But he's uh... <laughs> They're rubbish. <laughs> I'm not paying enough. Um, so yeah, basically, you know, it's, it's quite in-depth look at your, at your personality type your, and at your experience of who you are, using the lens of type and the model, uh, John Beebe's model, the eight function, eight archetype model, or depth typology as it's now becoming. That's the basis for it, and applying that in a very practical way to life to reduce stress, to look at relationships, how to make better relationships in your life, and how to look at your career and where you, what your purpose in life and what you want to do with your life. Really important things. I've got an MSc in organizational psychology, uh, done BPS psychometric testing, um, level A and B as they were called, qualifications. Um, that's a little bit of introduction to me. I'm interested in sort of what who we've got in the room. I know we've got a lot of different backgrounds here. <coughs> Are there any people in the room who are psychologists by trade who call themselves psychologists? There's a few here. A few psychologists. Any chartered psychologists? A few, yeah, most of you. Um, so you've gone to the next level. You've, you've worked in the industry and, and gone even further. Um, is there any counselors and psychotherapists, people from that kind of background, that use it in that context? Uh, any people from sort of HR who've taken a CIPD route, yeah? So a few people from that who use it in the workplace, um, from that uh, background, and other type practitioners. Quickly, any any sort of things I've missed, areas I've missed out? Was it maybe religious institutions, community groups? Do you know anything like anything I missed? Just because you love it? That kind of thing, that's kind of where I'm from originally. Uh, type fans, people who are just here because they love type and they find it useful and they want to know more. A lot of people are excuses. Yes, okay, you can be in various groups, yes. <laughs> we can be in several sets at once. So yeah, we've got a diversity of people. I'm just interested in, in, in where you're coming from. And that might sort of give you different angles on, on how you approach what I'm going to talk about. So one of my core messages about this is type is in danger. That's what I believe. You know, it's, it's a point where... There's noticeable negativity from some quarters towards psychological type. You may have come across this in, in various videos, articles, things that float around the internet, criticizing, attacking, even outright dismissing type as a valid way of looking at personality. You know, there's some serious stuff out there. It's not like people just kind of accept each other and get on with their lives. There's some negativity going on. Now, personally, I think this comes from a misunderstanding of theory. And most of you will probably take a lot of these things with a pinch of salt and look at it and go, well, actually, they don't know what they're talking about. You know, a lot of the time, the criticisms are based in a misunderstanding of type theory and taking it for something that it isn't and criticizing it on that basis. Completely misinformed criticism. Um, 
sometimes rightfully, there are criticisms. We've got our own criticisms, that's how we develop our, our practice as well. But a lot of these big criticisms come from misunderstanding. Obviously, some of it can be founded because there is an ethical and sort of amateur application of type out there. There's websites which use type but don't do it ethically. Any, any type site that tells you that it can tell you your personality type but not give you a one-to-one -one feedback session with a professional is doing it unethically. You can't tell someone's type just by doing a 10-question thing on a website. You know, there's a lot of trivial trivialization of, of type out there, putting it in a sort of parlor game context where, quite rightly, people want to know about their, themselves. People have a hunger for self-understanding, right? Every, most people in the world do. And therefore, they're going to go out and they're going to find this. They're going to, they're going to find something. And, but that's sometimes the most accessible way for them to do it. Um, it's a shame that there's no way of stopping that. You know, I mean, we've got some people from OPP here. There's no way people from OPP can shut down sites that use unethical psychological time. Be nice. Be nice if you could. You know, if they used your trademarks, you probably could. But the, you know, there's no trademark on ideas, concepts. Um, and it's, you know, we do our best to protect the, 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 the trade that we're working in by using best practice and, thing and, and qualifications, but there's no way to stop this kind of thing happening. Um, the other way types in danger is through what I call academic exclusion. Um, now, I've been done this uh, master's level degree course in the last few years, and you know, being someone who loved type, I was thinking I would, go, you know, I would go and there'd be loads of people who were really into what I love. And no, that wasn't the case. There was a lot of like sort of sidelining, so to speak, of of Jungian psychology, especially. He wasn't mentioned once in my course. Um, oh, also, um, MBTI was kind of put in a little sort of guilty little extra little lecture at the end of the course by by one of our lecturers who used it and actually found it useful in, in our work. But it wasn't put out there as, as a major theory to, to study and follow. I did a little bit of uh, research on Google Scholar. So yeah, that's where most peer reviews research gets cited, listed, ends up. That's how people find it in universities these days. So if you're not on Google Scholar, as far as like, the academic world goes, you kind of don't exist, you know, unless you're, people are really going looking for stuff through other sources. Um, I searched for the word the term MBTI, and I actually had to exclude MBTI, which is actually a type of uh, it's it's an enzyme from a from a bacteria, which is related to tuberculosis. It's called MBTI. Uh, there's also a thing called mindfulness-based therapy for insomnia, MBTI. You have to exclude these things if you're looking for MBTI articles. Now, MBTI articles, with excluding those, there was 9,050 within the last five years that came up. 9,050 citations. But then I searched for the big five, which is the model which is most mainly used by, by the majority of, of psychologists these days for personality. And there was 755,000. 9,000 compared to 755,000 for the big five. That gives you some idea of the skew to which the, the academic world is working with particular models. Okay, so MBTI is not popular, and, and some people have said, uh, <coughs> one of the critical articles actually said that um, people who were in the industry, like people who were mainstream people in the type industry, still didn't use it in their academic research because they were kind of embarrassed to. They felt it would have a negative impact on their, stand, their standing to be using it in their research. So that's a bit of a problem. Um, like I said, the psychology courses, like the one I was on, certainly not all of them are like that. Some are more supportive. It just depends who your lecturers are. But a lot of them just kind of exclude or sideline type. So my question here was: Is type heading for the psychological dustbin? Big horrible thought. I don't want that to happen. You know, we all find it profoundly useful in our lives and, and brings a lot of meaning to what we do. But you know, if this trend can, can continues, you know, are we headed for? complete exclusion and you know that's a bit of a problem so why do we have this misunderstanding um, well one thing I think is type is complex it's not a very straightforward thing for people to get their head around um, 
for a start, like preferences are a subjective thing that, as I go over say later, they're phenomenological. You can only tell your preferences internally. People can see your behavior and try and, and work out what your preferences are, but they can never actually tell what they are. You, only you know where your attention is being pulled to. Uh, in comparison, trait psychology, which is what the big five is, is the, the leading model for personality, it's relatively easy to understand. What is trait psychology? Three words, measurable, observable behavior, kind of ties it up. It's not the behavior itself. It's actually kind of a placeholder. But the only way you can see it is through the behavior, and so therefore it might as well be that. Um, easy to understand. People can understand how much of something am I holding in my hand? How, you know, how can I measure it with a tape? That's what people find easy to get their head around. But type is slightly more subtle and complex than that, and uses a way of looking at the world which is more quantitative, um, not in the main, so mainstream mindset. Type today, even today, uses somewhat outdated language and concepts. I mean outdated from the fact that the sort of language I was reading in academic articles for my master's degree was not the stuff that I read in psychological types or even any of the later books and, and works on, on psychological type. The same concepts and words don't come up, then it's like they're talking different languages. Partly that's because it's got its roots in, in Jung. Jung was part of really much earlier sort of type of psychologist, you know, and he was basing his roots in a lot of wider culture, philosophy, art, spiritualism, mysticism, all kinds of different study areas. And the sort of things he talk about now, psychologists today wouldn't really talk about. It's not in the, in the modern science mindset. And yet we've carried on a lot of that language from, from Jung's time to the, to the way we use type today. And even the words Jung used, we don't use because he wrote in German. So the words we use were actually the best approximations from translators who translated his words. And, we've no, and sometimes the German words don't even have direct equivalents in English. So we're not always even using exactly what he meant. Um, so the language gets confusing for people. Um, but I think it's our responsibility to explain it better. It's not up to it. We can't just sit there and go, this is the way things are. You've got to understand us. And then people don't understand us and criticize us, and we go, well, you're wrong. It's our fault for not explaining it better. It's our fault for not finding the right language to explain type in a way that people get it. That's my challenge to you as a type community. You know? And I think it's really great that so many people come to this talk today. Some people might see it and go, oh, I know what type is. You know, but do you know it in a way that you can share it and, and uh, with the sort of people who are criticizing it and get it across to people who would challenge it and not accept it? Um, so I've got an exercise for you. Um, <coughs> Now, I'm going to say this, this is like a hypothetical situation. You randomly meet a world-leading professor of personality psychology in a lift. <coughs> you bump into them in a lift. Um, amazingly, he's not familiar with type. It could be she, actually. I've just been a bit gender biased here, sorry about that. <laughs> if, he, if he, she becomes an advocate of type and starts writing about it, using it in their research, perhaps the future of type could be secured or supported more in that direction that we wanted to go. Um, you know, lift, you've got 30 seconds to explain what type is in a way that he will understand. So you just kind of go, no, so what is this type? What is this thing you work with? And you have 30 seconds to explain that. Now, I tried this with my partner last night, and she's an ENFP, um, and she goes, no, I can't do it, it makes me freeze. <laughs> um, and then, I guess she had some kind of traumatic memory of like some teacher at school going, explain something logically and unambiguously now, and then they're like, oh, I can't. <laughs> you know, so we've got the type, we looked at the type um, spectrum for this conference, and there's a lot of NFs, and there's a lot of uh, extroverted intuitives, so I apologize if it has that effect. I'm not trying to be that teacher that did that. I'm trying to be, I think of it like tough love. You know, I'm challenging you because it'll help us, because we want type to, to be popular and, and understood. <coughs> So I want you to go and do this. I'm going to give you two choices. Um, you can either just do it on your own and think quietly in your own mind and write it down, or if you want to work with somebody else and talk about it, put your hand up. 
And then people with their hand up pair up, find each other, and you can talk about it, and you can share. I'm going to give you not just that, so I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to do this. All right? This is the challenge. It's like the crystal maze. <laughs> I'm like Richard O'Brien, but I don't have tight leather trousers. Come on, right. Are you all working individually? Is this it? Um, oh. If you want to work together, put your hand up, find each other. People with hands up, take the initiative. Pair up. One of you's going to have to move. Shuffle around a bit. <laughs> okay, you've got approximately two minutes to save the world. Go! What is time? Said the professor. Now, I'm not going to be asking people to share this with the group. I might, we might have time for discussion at the end, and if people want to share at the end, that, that might be okay. Um, I don't want to because I'm going to like criticise some things in, in the uh, in the spirit of, of improving and learning. So I'm not going to criticise your things in front of the group. I'm going to look at some examples that I just found. Um, yeah, the recent ABTI standards document, and this was from a specific part of it that actually that um, was making a particular point. Um, so it wasn't just a general introduction to type, but it, it was. Um, anyone from APTI here? <laughs> anyone write the standards document? Okay, so. No, but we know who did. Okay. <laughs> so this is. This is what it says. A psychological type is a description of a dynamic system with a holistic, holistic theme and moving energy among processes and between the conscious and the unconscious. So I think this illustrates just quickly a few of the problems we run into when we're describing type. This is quite uh, an example. There's similar examples out there of types sort of described using this same kind of language. Um, I mean, the idea of a dynamic system, you know, as opposed to something rigid, I think that's an idea that we all try and get across because it kind of dissolves that idea of um, just boxes that you put people in, right? So I think you can see what they're getting to there. Um, holistic theme. I mean, holistic's kind of a slightly dangerous word, right? As is energy. Holistic and energy, the sort of words that make you look like you've had a bit too much weed to smoke and they think you're a bit of a hippie, right? Because it, it kind of makes you, it, it's like, you start to get into the sort of words that, that you know, science has been trying to get away from. Sad, I think, you know, not, not always a good thing, but it's the way it goes. And there's certain things, you know, talking about holistic theme and, and energy. Energy is a difficult one because in science it has specific meaning. So that it's like the capacity to do work. That's essentially one of the basic descriptions of it. Um, this is taking more from kind of Jung's idea of energy. Um, he would have called it libido energy, which is different to Freud's libido, which is like the sex drive, right? But you've got Jung's libido, which is basically like psychic energy that you can expand the form like you, in the same way you've got potential energy when you hold a ball above the earth and, and it's ready, it can drop, but it's got energy ready to be used. In the same way we've got psychic energy that, that can be used in process. I think we all understand that as type practitioners, but I don't think in the mainstream psychology world it really has a kind of analogy like, like psychic energy talk about that at a BPS conference, I don't think we get a great reception. You know, it's, it's maybe in the consciousness and, and experiential uh, conference that they do, but not maybe in the mainstream. Um, and the conscious and the unconscious, I'll get more into that in a minute, but this is um, this idea of the conscious and the unconscious is something I also want to challenge. The unconscious, it's quite a different, tricky and ambiguous term. There's several things in there, I think, which stop lending themselves not to a very precise description and something that might not be as accepted by a lot of parts of psychology. Um, Wikipedia, just type it in. First of type refers to the psychological classification of different types of individuals. According to type theories, for example, introverts and extroverts are two fundamentally different categories of people. This kind of worries me because, you know, this is one of the, the biggest sources of information out there. And even Wikipedia doesn't quite understand it. It's like, this is sort of reinforcing the misunderstanding that type, types are fundamentally different beings, like different models of car, or different models of iPhone, or something that have just come out of a factory, different. You know, and that's wrong, because ultimately what's underlying type is the similarity, that we all have the same sort of inherited psychological architecture, but we tend to just develop it and prioritize it in different ways. We've all got the same potential within us. That's what Jung was trying to get to when he talks about the, the, the self. You know, and 
and wholeness, the wholeness that we all kind of have in common as a potential that we can achieve, right? That's kind of what's at the heart of time, really, I think. And, and yet, sort of mainstream's sort of reinforcing this idea of different, different types of models of human being, which is not what it's about. Um, Oxford Dictionary's kind of a well-respected source of information here in England. A collection of personality traits which are thought to occur together consistently. That's what it's called, personality type. Well, that's reducing it to personality traits. And personality trait is a completely different model of assessing personality with a different basis to it. Which, again, is worrying. So it's no wonder we're misunderstood and criticised. Because Oxford Dictionaries and Wikipedia are out there giving completely like misleading ideas of what it even is. And you know, even APCI, the world's largest sort of type organization, is you know, it's got some language which, you know, even though we understand it, is not going to maybe translate as well across to other scientists out there. So how do we move forward? So I'm going to unload my brain a bit for the rest of the talk and talk about some of the concepts and ideas I've sort of come to link in with type and ways that maybe we can help to explain it better. I'm going to share my own current working definition of type um, as a, some food for thought. Maybe it'll help you to, to develop your own uh, description as well. So I want to talk about the mind. The mind's really central because you know anyone who works in uh, mental health professions as, as a whole, whether psychology or psychiatry or even um, you know, counseling, psychotherapy and things like uh, coaching, we're always working with the mind. You know, the, Something struck me when I read this work by Dan Siegel, who's one of my favourite authors. He's someone who's a therapist, psychiatrist, um, neuroscientist. Draws, he's, he draws from a lot of different backgrounds, which is great because he sort of crosses boundaries within his field. Um, he's got this, his, what he calls interpersonal neurobiology, which is like uh, an amalgamation of various different ideas from different fields related to psychology and neuroscience. So he, in, in him and his team, he formed a team of esteemed professionals in his field. They surveyed over 100,000 mental health professionals globally. 95% they found have never been given a lecture defining what the mind is. So for a profession where the thing that they're working with is the mind, it boggles the mind that 95% wouldn't really have a way of explaining what it is that they're working with. So I think we need to start with the mind, right? Well, one of the first things he brings to light is that the mind is a process, right? The mind's a process. What other processes do we have? Like the universe itself is going through a process where they say it started as a tiny point and it's expanding outwards. And that process that it undergoes of expansion is, a, is one example. A tree growing from a seed or an acorn into a fully grown tree is a process. It's a, it's a thing that happens over time where change occurs. So the mind's a process. It's not just a thing. It's not a noun. It's like not the mind. It's like the brain. Yeah, you can pick up a physical brain, but you can't do that with the mind. It's an intangible process. This is uh, Dan Siegel, sort of drawn from Dan Siegel's descriptions of what he says the mind is from his... An emergent, self-organizing, dynamic process that is embodied and relational. Let me try and decipher this a bit. Okay? <laughs> He's saying it's emergent, so it's it's arising spontaneously and and it's changing and growing. It's something that's self-organizing. It has its own plan. The process has its own blueprint of what it has to do built into it. It's a dynamic process, again, it's changing over time. It's embodied. So he talks about the mind as inherently intertwined with the body, not just the brain in the skull, but the entire body, the entire nervous system, the entire body. It's something that's inherently part of our entire uh, physical self. Um, and also relational. You cannot separate the mind from our relationships with other people and other minds. They are completely intertwined. The mind, as its process, the relational part of it is part of its definition. Um, he says that the mind arises from and also shapes the flow of energy and information across time. Um, again, that's when he describes information, he's saying information is energy that has a meaning. And when we take information, when we take things within our mind and give them a meaning, they become information. And 
this flow of information that works through our, our, our mind processes is what it arises from, but also shapes it. So it's quite a paradox. He's saying it gives rise to our inner subjective experience and mental activities such as emotion, thinking, and memory. This is his working description of what the mind is. But we need to have an understanding of what the mind is to, to, to even start to understand what we're looking at at the time. The next thing to look at is consciousness. And consciousness is one of the key aspects of the mind. There's an awful lot written about consciousness, and there's an awful lot of ideas of what it is. You could go on and do an entire degree just on trying to define consciousness. There's so many ways of looking at it. Um, one of Siegel's descriptions, definitions here is the subjective experience of being aware. I quite like to think of consciousness as engagement. So, any, so a process of the mind that can engage with something else out there, the environment, or part of its own mental process, other mental processes within the mind, it has to have some way of interacting. So some process that can interact with the environment or with some other process is consciousness. If it can't interact, it's not alive. It's not consciousness in my mind, in my book. In my book, and if you look at that as a way of defining it, that'll sort of become more clear as we go on. Um, consciousness actually was the original basis for psychology around the time when Jung was writing his early works. It was a different kind of psychology, and, and consciousness, but subjective experience, was the central thing that people studied. But then, sort of further into the 20th century, behaviorism took over, which still really kind of half reigns today, even though consciousness has become more studied again since the 80s. Uh, this behaviorism approach of, of looking at external behaviors is exactly what the mainstream trait personality models are based on. So already, you know, by using type as a phenomenological type of, of way of looking at personality, it's something that, like I said, to really understand it, you have to understand it from the inside. You have to study it from your own, or from the, the person who you were talking about, so study it from the inside out. You can't just observe it from the outside. Um, now, one interesting thing that, that, that I got from, from Sean Beebe, um, he's kind of become my mentor over the last year, really, and uh, um, he's had some fascinating ideas. He sees Jung's function attitudes, and you might have been, you might call them um, cognitive functions, some people call them by different names. We talk about the eight combinations that you get from combining the four functions, intuition, sensing, thinking, feeling, with introversion and extroversion getting the, the eight different function attitudes. And Jung's, Jung, John Beebe believes, you know, what Jung meant by these function attitudes, he meant them as types of consciousness. For Jung, really, these eight function attitudes were the types. He doesn't actually have a 16-type system in his, in, in his works. Jung doesn't. That was, that was a later development by Catherine Cook Briggs, Isabel Briggs Myers. They created a 16-type system. Jung had eight types, so the types were the eight functions, That's from Jung's perspective. And what they really, if you think of them as their types of consciousness, if you think of consciousness as engagement, a process that can engage, the eight function attitudes are types of consciousness that engage in functionally different ways with the world. Now, if you take John Beebe's model, he has not... He adds eight different archetypes, which you can just think of different ways, uh, qualities of, of behaving, basically, or, be, or interacting, the qualities of, of, of interaction. If you combine those eight with the eight functionalities, that actually gives you 64 components or parts of consciousness that we have now to study through, through our type models. So it's a great way, I think type is, is one of the best ways to qualitatively understand and give a, a structure to consciousness, to understand our subjective experience, to be able to segregate it into ways that, that are, are categories that make sense. And I think it's quite exciting that, and to, as well as Jung's eight types of consciousness, we've now also got really 64 component parts. That was kind of my logical extrapolation from John's 
model really, but now we've got a 64 component model. Um, so we've got the mind, and consciousness is these processes that have a way of engaging um, within and without of the mind. We've got attention. Attention is the next important thing to look at. Attention that you can think of as really is the focus of consciousness. Um, to what is consciousness, consciousness attending, and what of these types of consciousness that we, we have available are being focused upon or, in, or, or being used to engage with the world. Um, there's a lot of psychological research on attention. So if we're going to use some, anything to describe time in a way that will be understood by the mainstream <coughs> world, I think attention is one of the constructs, as they call it, that it's, it's one of the key things here. Because that's what, actually what we're talking about. And it's not a word that I ever hear time practitioners use, attention. But it's the key to what we're talking about this time. Um, so if you think about it, what we're asking by what is your preference is where is your attention naturally drawn to? That's actually what we're really asking now. But we never use that word, attention. You should pay attention to that word. It's very important. So broadly, there's, you know, there's a lot of research, a lot of different ideas, a lot of pe different people with different ideas. But the two major types of attention that I can sort of see here, really, is what might have to be by different, very different words we call orienting attention, bottom-up attention. It's not about drinking. Um, exogenous. That means that it's kind of orientated by the outer world. It's like the environment causes the attention to divert. Um, and covert is another name for it. But generally, the idea we're getting from that kind of attention it's really an attention that sort of guides itself, whether that's by the by its own dynamics of how it works internally or by the environment calling that attention into play. So that's one kind of attention. It's not the sort of attention that we deliberately pay, pay attention with. Then there's the other type of attention, which by many words is called things like executive attention, top-down, endogenous, overt. It's a sort of attention which actually, in, in sort of the type and in, in Jungian terms, we probably call the ego. The sort of attention which we do deliberately. There's a couple of really important things um, to to say about the ego. You know, one is that the ego conscious, ego attention, the ego consciousness is is reflexive. It's aware of being aware. When you when you're diverting attention using the ego, you're aware of where your attention is. You have kind of an observing, what they call observing ego. You've got a sort of secondary awareness. You divert the attention, but you know it's happening. It's also willful, deliberate, effortful. It takes effort to focus the ego, which we know about in type, because we know when we're using a non-preferred function, we try to use it deliberately, that's highly stressful. It uses a lot of energy. Um, the ego is focal. I call it the human doing. You know, if we have two sides to ourselves, which is what this is suggesting, two sides to the mind, essentially, which two types of attention, um, you've got this orienting bottom-up attention, which really I think is kind of actually to do with what uh, what John Beebe calls the little s self. And this is something self-psychology or self-experience is something that it's more being studied in psych in the psychotherapy world. People like Heinz Kohut, K-O-H-U-T. He's he's one of the people that was sort of the early self-psychologists writing about this. It was a a 20th century trend going towards self-psychology. And it's all, again, it's more subjective. It's all about personal experience. Um, John Beebe talks about this a lot now, this idea of the self, the little s self. That marks it out from the big s self with a capital S because that was a separate Jungian idea, which is a completely different thing, but related in, in, in certain ways. It's still part of our understanding of the psyche. So what I'm suggesting here is really this, this attention, these two different attention systems sort of tie in with these ideas that we sort of talk about by different terms, ego and self. Ego being this reflexive, willful, deliberate, effortful, focal, this human doing that we have in us that wants to achieve and do and can deliberately change our attention and focus on whatever we want. Um, 
It's also what um, Daniel Kahneman, has anyone read uh, his book, yeah, Thinking Fast and Slow? Really popular book, it's sold millions of copies, it's, it's mm -hmm. one of the Nobel Prize for its behavioral economics and, and decision work. Um, one of the big players in psychology, but you know, you've got this, this idea of system one and system two. And I think system two, you know, really is a description of this tie in what we're talking about by this ego consciousness and, and also by this, this uh, executive attention. And the other side of this, this hot side of the mind, we've got this self experience. It's a different kind of consciousness. When, when we're talking about in type, we're talking about when we're talking about flow, when we're talking about grip, we're talking about getting carried away and you know in, in consciousness. The thing about self-consciousness is rather than it being reflexive, rather than us having an awareness of us being aware, it's more that when we're doing it, we're in it. We, it's not just we're in it, we're are, we are it. We are that consciousness. It's like you know, when you're angry and you're stressed and you're in the grip of, of your inferior function, you become that. You don't have that extra viewpoint to stand back and look at it. You are that consciousness. And we all know what that feels like to be there, but then it's also you could also relate to the wandering mind. You know, when you just think about your general experience, you're probably experiencing in this talk. Part of your, your ego is trying to focus your attention on what I'm saying and, and to take it all in. But then there may be this wandering mind, this self-experience, which is diverting your attention to other processes, other thoughts, other things. That's fine, I don't mind. I don't mind if you do that, because I understand you. <laughs> I won't take it personally. But yeah, it, you know, we can't help it. We have a mind that it does what it wants. It's a mind of its own. It's our self-experience, pure consciousness expressing itself. Then we have our ego side of ourselves, and we spend a lot of time in this self. We like to think of ourselves as having complete self-determination and being driven and existing from the ego most of the time, but I don't think that's actually true. You know, and a lot of research has shown that, you know, actually before we make a conscious ego aware decision, we've got um, this, this, this activity in the brain six, like six or seven seconds before that they can determine what our decision is going to be before we even know that we've made it. You know, so there's a lot, and, it's this, and this is what we, in, in the old language, we call the unconscious. You see, there's a problem with this, these words, the conscious and the unconscious. Because actually, in terms of consciousness, if we think about consciousness as a process that has the ability to engage or to be experienced, then what we call typically the conscious and the unconscious, they're both forms of consciousness. And this is what John Beebe says as well, that we're doing a disservice to the unconscious, calling it the unconscious. We're kind of not giving it the credit it deserves as a form of consciousness. It's just that it's not ego consciousness, it's not reflexive, we're not aware that we're aware of it. Does that make sense? We're just in it when we're in it. The unconscious is still conscious, very much so. And there's a lot actually, you know, as people say, that it's, it's the tip of the iceberg thing, the ego consciousness is the tip. And there's a whole lot more actually of consciousness there. So I hope you get this idea that we've got this, this idea of two minds, essentially, that we're living between, with different ways of focusing their attention, with different experiences for us as human beings. Um, I'm going to talk about opposites as well. Because um, if we're talking about type, we have to talk about opposites. This was the key to Jung's book, To Psychological Types. The problem of opposites. You know, that was its kind of subtitle. That's what he talks about. He, he spends, he only does like, you know, the one or two chapters at the end, like defining the types. But the rest of the book, this much of the book, is about the problem of opposites and how he's recognized it within classical literature, medieval times, the work of Schiller, the poet and philosopher, within determining character, poetry, in psychiatry, aesthetics, and philosophy. All of these areas, this is where he gets his, his evidence from for the support of, of types, the existence of types and the validity of it. So it's really central, the idea of opposites. But how does that work? Because in modern, it's, it's, it's kind of weird. Opposites gives you this, it's the basis of, of what types are built on, dichotomies, opposites. But that's not the way that really mainstream psychology looks at the world, because traits are not dichotomous, they're based on a spectrum of like 0 to 10 or 0 to 100 or whatever. They're a continuous scale. Um, this idea of a binary system 
it's not part of the mind, the main mindset. Even though in in occupational psychology there are quite a lot of models which are almost type based, lots of other different models that are not psychological type, where they have like um, you know it's things like the Jahari window and things like that. You know, any, anything where you sort of draw a, a little cross and then you put different quadrants. You know, it's essentially a type based model. Um, it's, it's, it talks about opposites, but. But what is the basis? You know, if we were to try and explain opposites and, and get some understanding among more mainstream science, how would we do that? Um, I mean, we know that in the world of physics, in the world in the electromagnetic realm, which is the world, the realm of energy, which is essentially what we're talking about when we talk about the mind, because it's intangible, it's an energetic process. The opposites are fundamental. You know, in the electromagnetic world, you have waves and fields that work in a in a way by which positive and negative charge have to a complementary balancing opposites. And magnetic opposite poles are in a similar way opposites. So it makes sense that the mind as, a, as an energetic process would, would also have opposites as a fundamental. But if that's not enough to persuade people, I do think that what we need what needs to be done actually is is research. Maybe I could do a PhD in this one day, who knows? Depends if we've got the time or not. Might be busy looking at orangutans. But We've got, so let's think about the brain. Um, so we know that the brain on, its, on a small level is made out of neurons, nerve cells, right? And the nerve cells link together at what's called a synapse. Are you all with me? You see this picture of a synapse? You know, it's kind of like a, like a river delta where the, the two end, ends of the, the nerves mesh together. And there's not an electrical connection because they're actually neurotransmitters that like, get transmitted from one end of the synapse bing, to the other one. So it's not like a wire joining a wire when nerves are joining in the brain. It's more like an electrical wire, and then you've got a little postman which takes a, a message and goes to the next one, and delivers it, and then the next one sends a message off. It's like a little relay service. Um, but what happens in the brain is, and this is the way that um, most Neuroscience studies activation of the brain. Often they'll do like metabolism, they'll do MRI scans of the brain and they'll study what happens when you do something, what parts of the brain activate, because they can see what, what oxygen, where oxygen is going to, um, and where metabolism is occurring. So, but because there's not a direct connection from wire to wire, there's actually different connections that can happen. Some neurons activate the next neuron. But some neurons suppress the next neuron. So sometimes, some, con some connections between neurons, you send a signal down one, and it sends the little neurotransmitter message. The other one go, don't fire. Now for me, that is the exact basis of opposites. Because when one is dominating, the other one is inferior. Or when one is activated, the other one is suppressed. And it doesn't just happen in the brain on a, on a neuron level. It also happens on a macro level. Our brain's divided as, as two hemispheres, and you know, one, when one hemisphere predominates, uh, the, the frontal lobes can actually suppress the other one from, from having its say in the matter. Different brain regions and networks can actually have this dominant suppression relationship, and I think there's a lot of research needs to be done in that area if we want to find support for type that will link into mainstream science. If anyone wants to carry this research forward, uh, I'd, be, I'd love to talk to you about it. Um, so, Jung, in type we talk about preferences. Um, Jung would talk about habitual attitude, something that becomes a habit, something that you, you do, something that falls to habit, something that draws you and you keep going towards one side. So when we've got our two opposites, um, the preferences What I would call, and this is my suggestion here, like what I call, is it preference and what I would call using academically sounding language, intrinsic potential bias. So if we've got two systems or two conscious processes that have a sort of opposing relationship and our consciousness can focus its attention on either one or the other one, because it can't focus on both at the same time, because when it focuses on one, the other one is suppressed. That's the relationship of opposites. Um, so is, is a preference just saying that it's an attentional bias? So 
So attention is biased. So when, when the tension sitting in the middle going, hmm, which way should I go? There's like a bias thing. I'm going to get pulled more towards that way. Um, it looks a bit like this is what I use in my talks to describe the preference. Here's another kind of system, it's a physical system, it's a seesaw. Um, and there's a bias because someone's moved the central point around which it pivots. So now there's a bias towards one side and it drops down because the long end is heavier and therefore it will be biased towards that side. It's not saying that you can't, obviously no one can use both sides and both preferences, but it takes more effort to do it. I like, I like using this as a, as a way to, to teach preferences to people because they can get the visual metaphor. I think it's really powerful. I don't know, does anyone else do similar things? Does anyone use these things like this? Um, okay, so bear in mind, I'm jumping between lots of different ideas here on purpose, but I'm going to bring it all together at the end. I'm throwing loads of ideas and concepts of how we can relate type to different ideas, and I'm going to pull it together. The next one I want to look at is development. Um, now, we've already talked about how, for Jung, there was eight types, types of consciousness that he talks about, the, the, eight, the eight function attitudes. Um, so when we're saying what is type, we've actually got to distinguish between these two things. And I've seen, like, I've actually had a bit of debate with, with Roy Childs about this with him and um, Steve Myers. I know um, they were writing something about um, like type changing. Um, and what I think, you know, it's confusing because there's two different descriptions of type. If you strictly go down the Jungian route, type is the fun kind of the function attitude or habitual use of what. <coughs> We as MBTI practitioners talk about 16 types. And the 16 types consist of a dominant function and an auxiliary function, and then a dynamically organized stack of, of, of the other functions. We know that we have all of the eight function attitudes, right? We have the potential to use and develop them all. Um, but what is the MBTI type? It's, for me, it, it's a developmental pathway. Why do I say that? Because like I said, we, we all kind of go from this point, you know, I don't believe you want to, we don't want to give people the idea that, that different types of, like different models of car, different, completely different, con differently programmed, constructed types of person, you know, I do you believe that we all have the same potential and the same mind, but that what the type is, is just a different pathway to get from A to B. A being when we're born, or even pre-birth, when essentially we have zero of what you would call the, 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 well, the development process to um, A to B or A to Z, the end being however far we get down the development process within our lives. And if we went as far as we could, we get to, to the ultimate level of wholeness, which no human being ever really will because you don't live long enough. Um, I believe we'd all end up at pretty much a similar place with a similar looking kind of time, so to speak. But obviously, we kind of don't get there. So we kind of we die somewhere along the process of trying to get there. Um, but you know, we all start off from a fairly similar place with what you would call, you know, this what we just call the, the self-experience, self-consciousness, raw consciousness, experience expressing itself, but without the ego to 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 have any deliberate control over it. That's what babies are. You know, they're just consciousness expressing in a pure form. Um, so yeah, seeing the MBTI types as development pathways is really important. And I think um, Dan Siegel talks about the development process of the mind being what he calls integration. And actually, what by integration, he means a two-step process. One which we're kind of familiar with, um, differentiation, a term that Jung used, what we use in our practice. Um, I, call, I talk about it as the branching subdivision of finer, more nuanced forms. We've got a really simple, basic function which just goes up, 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 and then you kind of develop it, you know, you to, it branches into, into more and more useful and finely honed different sub-functional parts. I don't think we've actually got much understanding of how that process works in time. I think maybe 500 years down the line, if people still studying time, we might have a developmental map for um, introverted intuition or extroverted thinking or whatever function of how, what are these branches of, of, of developmental levels. But um, the second part of integration is linkage. 
it's kind of weird that the mind, you know, it splits apart only to be rejoined back together, to be linked into a more unified whole. But it's just ultimately the destiny of the mind. This is what it has to do. It has to unpack only to repack into a, into a more developed form. But this, the, you know, the, the MBTI types are just a, a developmental pathway saying, okay, this, we can't develop everything all at once. Let's develop a, one function at a time. Let's just take one and let's develop it. Let's differentiate it. And we'll link it and we'll integrate it into the, by using the ego to integrate it and develop it conscious. So I'm using it already conscious as we use it in the tight world, but um, an executive control over it, let's call it. So yeah, this is part of this, the, the, let's have an argument, <laughs> the debate. Um, uh, it depends, can type change? You know, and I've seen people like, like you know, Roy and, and Steve recently were writing, uh, yes it can, but they were actually using a, a, Jung, a, a quote from Jung to back that up. Um, and yeah, but if you take things all the way back to Jung, there were eight types. Um, and if you talk about their functionalities as, as types, as he was, then yes, obviously type does change because part of the development process, me going from, as an INTJ, develop my introvert intuition and then my extrovert thinking and then my introvert feeling, yeah. So my, my, my type, I, my habitual attentional focus on one of those functionalities, yes, it's changed. So I could argue by definition, yes, type does change. But if you're using MBTI, the 16 types, as, as the types, I say, no, it doesn't change because it's a developmental pathway. So even though your attentional focus on different functionalities has changed, your type as a whole is the developmental pathway, and that's what you're on, and that hasn't changed. The only way, you know, people get confused because they try and over, sometimes, you know, and this leads to lots of mental health problems, as we know, we see in people that we work with, when people try and override, whether deliberately or by force of parenting or other processes from the environment around them, try and override the intrinsic attentional development path that's going on, um, and then they think they're a type that they're not. So I think personally, if you if you if you are MBTI, if you think your MBTI type has changed, then you haven't discovered your type yet. You haven't really seen it in the context of the developmental path and and the forces which may or may not have caused you to try and override what actually was trying to happen. As we all know, with working with people, it's the hardest thing for people to un unravel and unpick the environmental influences which may have masked what actually their mind was trying to do all along. Um, no, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to, that. I'm going to go straight onto this bit because um, I want to have some time for discussion and, and stuff at the end as well. So, this is the working definition. I actually came up with this last night. This is a quote from me on PowerPoint. Um, so, I sat there and I looked at all this stuff and I was like, um, because yeah, I've been a bit, like I said, I'm a bit exhausted now, because I've been, like, two weeks ago I was in the jungle with the rainbow stones, um, and then, like, harshly flung back into reality in a, in a metal tin flying across the world, and uh, then catching up with all the BAPT accounts and all that stuff, and uh, hundreds and hundreds of emails. Uh, like I said, I didn't over-prepare as much, so last night I sat down and right, I've got to come up with the best definition I can, the types, it'll be really good, and I sort of looked at all the things, and this is my working model. But you know, disclaimer, it can change at any point. It's not fixed. It can change my mind. My mind can change itself. Um, but what type is? So this is different to what you wrote down before. A developmental pathway of neural integration characterized by the intrinsic and evolving attentional bias of system one. Look, Daniel Kahneman in there. Popular, so good. <laughs> The potential bias of system one between qualitatively complementary components, and that's talking about opposites. It's a nice way of saying opposites without saying opposites. They're qualitatively complementary um, components of consciousness. We know what we're talking about with consciousness now. And relating, this is my like hypothesis thrown in there, and relating to neural activation and suppression at the macro level. Because I think it's brain networks that really form our, our functions, and it's the 
it's the activation and suppression between them which causes this opposition that we talked about. Let's pick this apart again. The developmental pathway, really fundamental aspect of what type is. Take it out of the context of development and you've destroyed it. It doesn't exist anymore and, it's, and you're always going to interpret it wrong. Um, neural integration. So we know this two stage process of differentiation and linkage. The process of the mind, what it's trying to do to develop. Um, characterized by intrinsic, <coughs> intrinsic, if you've got, say, intrinsic motivation, it's something that you are, mo you are motivated by, you don't know why, you just are, it comes from inside you. If you're extrinsically motivated, you are because you know why, because you've made, made to be motivated by that thing, that person with the stick or whatever it is. Um, so it's, the attentional bias is intrinsic. It's part of this attention system that is the wandering mind, which, which guides itself, which you don't ex control using an executive ego function. Um, and it's an evolving attentional bias, because over your development path, it will change between different functionalities, depending, you know, if you, if you manage to get through a certain developmental stage, then the bias may change to take you on to the next one. That'd be fine. I mean, who's been through that? You know, in their lives, been on their development path, and suddenly become completely completely obsessed with something that to them was never an interest in their lives before to that point, within say 30 or 40 years of their lives, wouldn't have dreamed of doing swing dancing, but suddenly there I am on the dance floor, you know, and that's happened, that happened to me, you know, you, you, your attentional gets drawn towards that function that you need to develop. Um, the attentional bias is, like I said, system one, the, the, the underlying self-guiding, um, self-experienced between, as we know about the opposites, cognitively complementary components, consciousness, and we know about the last bit relating to neural activation and suppression, because I think that's possibly the basis of uh, uh, opposites, in a way that scientists might understand it. They'll get that, that there's a, you know, that there's a if, if, it's the ultimate thing, if you relate something to the physical brain, then you've got a concrete basis for, for, for something. It doesn't suddenly seem airy-fairy anymore. People will start to understand Obviously, to be confirmed by mine or your research, to whoever um, decides to do it. So that's my, my, my best guess so far. Sounds like a whole mouthful of, of words. If you said that to the guy in the lift, I don't know, Mike's going to give you a funny look. Or, or it might be intrigued, I don't know. But it sounds quite clever, I don't know. And I think that's important for, you know, a lot of people get a long way in psychology by coming up with clever names or clever descriptions of things which just fit in using cool language and, and words like salient. Anyone use that word in, a, in an essay before? And go, oh, I'm clever, I'm a proper psychologist now. <laughs> salient. Well, there you go. You know, it's, a, you know, it's, just, a, it's just one of those things you have to do to, to, to get taken seriously. Um, so back to the lift. We've got to go back down. We've gone to the top. So would you describe type differently now? Why am I just talking rubbish? I don't it's up to you. But I, I want you to decide. You know, have, have you picked up any thoughts or ideas from today? Have you? Are you all these areas I've talked about, I've just touched on, are huge topics that you can go away and, and, and search and, and look at and, and read upon. You may bring in different ideas that I haven't brought in. So I'm challenging you to, to redefine your understanding of time and start talking about it and, and try and bring in more recent modern mainstream concepts that will actually start to relate it to mainstream psychology. Because if we don't, if we don't reach out, we're going to get cut off and consigned. And we don't want that. Because we know, and the reason you're here is because you know what profound personal insight type can give. It's for a lot of people, you know, it's the most important thing, a sense of identity and an existential sense of being okay the way that you are. That's what type gives to people, and that's one of the most powerful things you can give to anybody. And it's something you don't get from the big five. You don't go, oh, my rating for neuroticism is 80. Awesome, I'm okay. It doesn't give you that sense. <laughs> you really don't get that. So I'm going to spend a few more minutes, uh, give you a chance to look at what you wrote before, have a rethink, see if we do anything differently. And then we can have a little discussion and you can share things if you want. If you don't, that's fine. Okay, so I'm going to give you another few minutes. Put your hands up if you want to work with somebody.
I thought I'd, um, I'd raise a quick point. Which, while you're just chatting, <laughs> uh, about um, something John just said, and, and this is interesting that you know an elevator pitch typically is like a business proposition, and you know if you were aiming it at that point of view, it would be slightly different. It would be like selling our services as practitioners. You know, if you're a potential client, you'd be giving a very different definition to this. But obviously, this is an academic. Um, description and, and therefore the sort of thing that we want to try and get into Google Scholar, which is where uh, the, the world's font of knowledge is now currently located. But if my talk today has any purpose, you know, it's to really make this, take this seriously, the, the threats that are out there. As, you know, we've had some great evidence there, you know, from Jane and others about real life examples of this happening. You know, it actually, like John was saying, you know, it's like a perpetual thing. Like, you know, if the, if the research isn't there, how can you, you can't get funding to do the research? And it's like, you know, the, the, you, you can't get trapped in a catch-22, you know. And we, we, we want to try and reach out, but it's our responsibility to keep developing type and the language that we use and the concepts that we use and try and understand, you know, if type represents something real about uh, the mind, then it's going to have uh, analogies in lots of other areas of psychology, then we need to make those connections to stay alive, to stay relevant. Um, just a quick last point, I, you know, my workshops, I handed out these flyers, we're talking about how do you explain type to the average man on the street? How's it gonna be useful to them? This was my, late, like, more, one of my recent attempts at doing that. It's bloody hard, as most people know who try to do it. Um, if anyone of you wants to discuss, you know, the ideas, right, you know, how do you promote type, the benefits of type to the man who wants to, you know, spend a few quid on a workshop that might change his life, I'm all ears. Do email me, I'm Richard Owen, um, Richard at whoamireally.com, that'll get you there. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for listening and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.